Today we have a problem solving excerpt, uh, a game with some dice. We're going to calculate the odds of winning a game called craps. You might just call it 7-Eleven or some other name. Uh, I'll review the rules as we go on and we'll go through in great detail talking about not only the numbers for the calculation, but some notes about why I think this is a good calculation. This came up specifically uh, in spring 2016 in the probability and statistics component of our course in uh, nuclear and particle introduction to physics research. Uh, it's part of the discussion that we'll have on April 15th if we have class that day. In previous years it's been within the lecture, but I thought it needed a little more fleshing out so I wanted to make it its own file. Uh, before doing this problem, we hadn't really introduced it too much at the time when I'm making this recording, but we have seen the binomial distribution, which has a little more than we need to do this problem. We just need to count a few things to do this problem, but the binomial distribution applies to a lot of things about throwing dice. Uh, we've talked just a bit already about counting and the birthday problem. And with regard to the birthday problem, which if you don't know is fine because we're not doing that here, uh, we talked uh, just for a moment already in class about strictly defining probability questions as a topic of its own. That is uh, the famous quote from myself that in probability often the answers are pretty easy. It's the questions that are hard. You need to define exactly what the question is to understand what formula is to write. But once you do, it's just some arithmetic. And that's the case here as well. Uh, I particularly like this problem because it's a, a good example of doing some counting where you, you have to go through and, and work out several cases separately. It's not that hard. All the arithmetic can be done with a simple calculator. Uh, it is even better a serious look at this topic of what is the question that's being asked. Because I think, at first blush, uh, people look at this problem and say that should be very, very hard to calculate, and it might even involve some infinite sum. It does not. Uh, before we really get going, uh, there's a couple background bits, and I think the first thing you might know already, and if you don't, you should be able to calculate it on your own. It's not hard. Uh, if you throw two dice, and I've listed here along the top the outcome of the first die and along the, the side left side the outcome of the second die the total that you can have sits in this table and of course there are six faces on a standard die so there are 36 possibilities for the total outcomes seven of those or sorry six of those come out seven those along the diagonal uh, five come out eight Five come out six. So the odds of getting a particular value are pretty straightforward to calculate from that. Uh, that is for a value on the pair of dice of two. You had to get two ones. There's only one way to do that. So you have one of 36 possibilities that do that. So your odds of getting it are one in 36. The most likely throw, as most people know, is the seven and there are six ways of doing that so the odds of getting a seven are six out of 36. so again you probably knew that or could calculate it easily but we're going to need it so i wanted to make it make it clear uh, the rules for the game and there are lots of variations on these rules if you go to a real gambling place in las vegas or atlantic city or something uh, they might have slightly different rules uh, they also have many, many other ways of betting that I'm not interested in. I'm interested in overall winning the game. And the standard simple rules on the first throw of the dice, a person, if they get 7 or 11 for their total, wins. If they get 2, 3, or 12, they lose. And if you play this casually with friends, you might, uh, you might play a different version where it's only 2 or 12 that lose. I'm using the three partly because it makes the arithmetic I have to do easier. I'll comment on why later. Uh, anything else after the first throw 
you throw again. On that subsequent throw, you've set what they call the mark from that first throw. So if you threw a 5, for example, your mark is 5. If you get a 7 on your subsequent throw, you lose. If you get, in that case, a 5, or whatever the result of your first throw is, you win. And that's the first throw, not the previous throw. Uh, if you get something other than a 7, or the result of your first throw, you throw again. You neither win nor lose. And that's actually a critical point in calculating what goes on in this game. So you'll notice that, in principle at least, one could throw the dice forever and neither win nor lose. Uh, we have enough information now to start calculating. The first row, it's pretty easy. Uh, if you win with a 7 or you win with an 11, the probability of that is 6 and 36 plus 2 and 36. Uh, you might be tempted to say, okay, 8 and 36, let's simplify. That's fine. It's correct. Doesn't always help, though. Uh, note that with a 2, a 3, or a 12, I have a total of 4 and 36 chances of losing. That's not the question. It's interesting to know. Uh, the chance of moving on with any other throw is 1 minus the odds of winning and the odds of losing. So I can calculate that 8 plus 4, that's 8 in 8 cases where I win, 4 cases where I lose, that's 12 cases. So 8 plus 4 is 12, and the odds of moving on, therefore, are 1 minus 12 over 36, or 2 thirds. Again, it's not the question, it might be interesting to know. If someone moves on, uh, that happens 2 thirds of the time you don't know how many more times you throw. As I said, you might have a knee-jerk reaction that says this could be an infinite series to calculate. Uh, but you do know that only winning or losing matters. That's, as I said before, the critical point. And that line's going to show up on the next slide, too. Uh, you can calculate for each relevant case, that is, for getting a 4, a 5, a 6, an 8, a 9, a 10, you can calculate the odds of winning or losing on a particular throw. So there's still some real work to do. We're going to have to get some arithmetic. It's not a big deal, but we'll get there. Let's take a case and calculate it. Say you got a 5 on the first throw. That happens a ninth of the time, 4 out of 36. And the odds of winning on that throw are also 4 of 36, and the odds of losing are 6 and in 36. So there are only 10 cases we really care about. Uh, 26 out of 36 cases we move on, but who cares? We only care about winning or losing. So in this case, where we started with a 5, at any particular subsequent throw, we have a 4 out of 10 chance of winning. Uh, all of these cases we're going to work out are obviously, I think, uh, more likely to lose than win, but that's what you expect in a game that casinos want you to play. It's only the odds of winning or losing that matter. We still have to account for everything else, but that should set us a guide for where we're going. Uh, those 10 cases where we win or lose are all that count for the five. And, of course, this only happens one in nine times in the first place. So uh, the same numbers, by the way, apply if I threw a nine the first time, because that uh, table of numbers I had for what happens on the two dice was symmetric uh, about a particular diagonal. Everything that applies for a five applies for a nine. Everything that applies for a four applies for a 10. And everything that applies for a six also applies or an 8. Uh, for both 5 and 9, you have a 4 in 10 chance of winning, but each happens one ninth of the time. So, if we move on uh, with the calculation, that is, the same logic is going to apply to 4 and 10 and 6 and 8. Of course, the details, totally different. Um, you can get the total odds of winning for each initial throw. That is, whether I threw a 4, a 5, a 6, 
an 8, a 9, a 10. I can get the odds of winning. And of course, I can't forget the odds of winning on my very first row with a 7 or 11. Uh, if I want to put this all together, I made a little table. This is the kind of thing you would put into a spreadsheet for an initial throw uh, that wins, an initial throw that gives me a 4 or a 10, a 5 or a 9, or a 6 or an 8, I can calculate the odds that that particular thing occurs. Winning, it's already stated, 8 out of 36. For the 4 or 10, that's 4 or 10 gives me a factor of 2. And there are 3 ways to get a 4, 3 ways to get a 10, so I have a total of 6 out of 36. The odds of winning in that case, same logic as I applied to my 5, are 3 ways to get a 4 out of 6 plus 3 is 9. That's because there are 3 ways to get a 4 and win, 6 ways to get a 7 and lose. So this table has all of the information for every possible way of winning. So what I need to do is take this table and take everything in the second column, multiply it by the corresponding element in the third column, and then add those things up. So if I did a spreadsheet, that's exactly the operations they would want to do. Uh, in the end, the arithmetic's a bit of a pain in the neck, but it's no big deal. Uh, note that one of those fractions I had was 5 elevenths. So you, you do end up with getting some pain in the neck numbers. Uh, I find it instructional to keep them as fractions. It's uh, easier to understand what's going on. And I know I, I, I'm not bragging that I did this with a pencil. I just wanted to make a point that there's nothing very complicated or deep. There are no terribly large numbers, in fact. Uh, the whole calculation raises a few good points about solving such problems. And some are bigger than others, but you need a rather careful description of the question. If you didn't catch that point, that only winning or losing matters at each throw after the first, then you could not get through this problem. You would get lost in all the cases that would lead you to an infinite series calculation, which you probably wouldn't be able to do. Uh, that said, it's a great example specifically of where processes that in principle can be infinite can have finite solutions. There were only, depending on how you look at it, a half dozen things to be calculated there. Uh, and one little arithmetic note on the side, simplifying fractions doesn't always help. If you're going to have to add things up in the end, uh, if you really want to understand what's going on, uh, getting a common denominator is going to be important, and therefore simplifying along the way doesn't help. That's not a big deal, but just a a little note to keep track of in your own calculations. Uh, I would note if you want to look at a variation of this game, for example, as I mentioned, sometimes people play with three not losing when you start, you now have all the machinery to do that. Uh, I didn't actually tell you the answer yet, did I? Well, it's 244 out of 495. Uh, before I get to my last slide, which is just this. Let me say, this calculation is also shown on Wikipedia. They do a good job with it. I just thought it was a good idea to go through it in order and point out some of what's interesting to me in the calculation. So it really wasn't that hard, was it? Have fun with it. Thanks. Bye.